So everybody take our song books. We're going to turn to page 130. Page 130. I never shall forget the day. Good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. What a precious, precious, precious time it is for baptizing. Baptizing doesn't take you to heaven. But the symbol that it represents, the symbol that it is, and the reality that it represents, of giving your heart to Jesus Christ, accepting him as your personal Savior, that's what takes you to heaven. And these two that have come this morning have recently done that, opened their heart to Christ, and now they publicly say to all of us and to all the world that I have died in Christ. That's why we submerge completely. It represents the death of Christ and also our death to sin. And then when we're raised, it's like the resurrection. We're raised to walk in newness of life with Jesus. Choir. Let's take our songbooks. We're going to turn to page fifty. Yes. 
morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. I'd rather be here than the best hospital in the state. Praise God for good health that we could all be here. The sun is shining. No one's happy about that? Goodness gracious. It's good to be in the Lord's house and I already feel the spirits moving this morning. I don't know about you, but baptism is one of the sweetest things to ever get to see, knowing that someone gave their heart to the Lord. It's just amazing. Tell those who would, gather at the altar. Uh, prayer requests are out on the board. Uh, let's continue to remember uh, Jay Head and her family with the passing of her father. This can be a tough week for her. Keep them in your prayers. It's a, if you've ever been there, it's a very difficult thing to lose a loved one, especially a parent. It's very large hole in your heart that you lose. <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for another beautiful day that you've given to us, another opportunity we have to come to your house and hear your word. We thank you for those that came for baptism this morning. And we thank you for the souls that were saved. And Father, we pray that you'd give Pastor the words that he'd have to say, give him the knowledge, and have him be the mouthpiece for you, Lord that you'd continue to have your spirit move through this place, Lord, and have our hearts and minds open to what you'd have us to hear. I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone under the sound of pastor's voice this morning that doesn't know you, I pray, Lord, that they'd come to your heart in saving grace and know that you're there for them with arms wide open. I pray, Father, that you'd continue to bless this service. It's in your heavenly name. Amen.
Glad you're here this morning. You glad you're here this morning? <clears throat> Can you hear that? We didn't have time to check it out this morning. Good to see you in the house of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I'm excited to be here today. Uh, they tell me they got the best preacher in the world here at this place, and I'm just excited to hear him this morning. How about you? Boy, don't fall out of your seats with excitement. <laughs> Y'all like Matt, is that what you said, and Tony? <laughs> if you have your Bibles, I would invite you to the 30th chapter of the book of Proverbs today. Proverbs chapter 30. If you're able, would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? We're going to start in verse 24, Proverbs chapter 30. There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. The conies are but a feeble folk, yet make their houses in the rocks. The locusts have no king, yet they go forth all of them by bands. The spider taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. You may be seated. <clears throat> Title of this message is Church Bugs. Now, I'll be careful not to point out which one I think you look like as I share this with you. Uh, when I first saw this years ago in the Bible, I thought, why in the world would God put that kind of information in there for us? And uh, so I want to share with us this morning just a few of the insects that we might find in our world today and how they can teach us a spiritual truth. So, without further ado, church bugs. The locusts. Now, locusts out in West Kansas uh, seem like they're never settled, as I, I've read about this. Seems like they're constantly jumping. Now, a locust in our language today would be a grasshopper. And in West Kansas and in Nebraska... I'm told that they fly abreast uh, four to five miles of them in width, and they fly for 10 to 12 miles at a time. And when they do, they have a tendency to block the sun. And I think is when I looked at that, I thought, how many times in my life have I blocked the sun? but not the S-U-N, but the S-O-N. How many times have I said something, done something, acted in such a way that would not bring honor or glory to the name of Jesus? And so I sort of ended up like the grasshopper, if you would. I also read where they're carnivorous. That means they're cannibalistic. They're not vegetarians as they would be, but when they don't have food available to them, They'll eat flesh. And sometimes, unfortunately, in, in churches that are supposed to be loving one another, and, and I don't know of anything going on, so I'm not directing this in anybody's direction. If, uh, if, you just, if the shoe fits, you just have to wear it, I suppose. But if you stop and think about this, sometimes when things aren't going our way, we become cannibalistic. We pick on one another. We talk about one another. Uh, we gossip about one another. And that's one of the worst things that we can do. If you remember, when Jesus was confronted by a person one time, they said, what is the greatest commandment of all? And he said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second 
is likened to it. Now, they didn't ask what the second commandment was, but it's so interrelated to the first commandment about loving God that Jesus shared that with them. He said, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. If we love one another as God intends for us to love one another, uh, we'll certainly be able to defeat the enemy as he comes into our life. Now, there's a particular uh, passage of scripture and I won't turn to it. And, and in fact, I don't even know where it's at. I know it's in the book of Numbers, I believe. But if I want to just share with you something about the grasshopper. If you will stop for just a moment and think about this, when the children of Israel have come out of Egyptian bondage and they've come into the wilderness and now they're ready to go into the promised land and God leads them right up to the brink of the Jordan River. Now, um, every time I preach this, I, I go Egypt this way. If I were you folks, I'd start sitting over here. Uh, because Egypt means lost. Egypt means that you're, you haven't been saved yet. And I know you have, and I'm just teasing with you. But when you come out of Egypt, they passed through the Red Sea. God parted it in a marvelous way, brought them into the wilderness, and it was only 11 days' journey to get to the promised land, but there was another body of water that was preventing them to get into the promised land, and it was called the Jordan River. And so... When God brought those people at the brink of the Jordan, he said to them, there's a land over there that's flowing with milk and honey. It's a glorious land. It's a jubilation land. It is a land that I have intended for you as my people. And I want you to know when you're saved by God's grace, he's got a promised land for you. It's not a physical piece of land, but it is a land that, uh, that you can enjoy the joy and the peace and the serenity of knowing that Jesus Christ is real in your soul. And so when he brings them up to Jordan, he says to them, I want you to cross over. Now, I know that it's fearful. I know that you're going to be afraid. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take 12 representatives, one from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And we're going to send those 12 men over into this land and we're going to ask them to spend 40 days over there and view the land, see what it's like and come back and bring us a report. After 40 days, here they come. They got, some of them got poles on their shoulders and they've got their buddy behind them that's got the same pole on his shoulders and probably they're weighted down because of the size of the, of the fruit that's in that land. And when they come back, they say, said, we want to tell you, it is just exactly the way God said it was. I believe all 12 of them said that. But then 10 of them said, but we better not go over there because there's giants in that land. And the giants in that land uh, are big and they look mean, and it's going to be a battle for us to go. If you ever go to what God's got promised in your heart, it'll be a battle to get there. But here's what they said. They said that the enemy stood against us, and 10 of them said, let's don't go. The other two said, we can do this. We can go. But here's what happened. There was a saying when they came back, and they said, we felt like when we looked at those giants, we felt like we were grasshoppers in their sight. And so we were in our own sight. Let me ask you a question today. How do you view yourself in your spiritual life? Because the way that you view yourself is the way your enemy will view you. That's the way Satan will view you. If you feel like an insignificant little unsettled grasshopper that's hopping from place to place and can never get settled in your spiritual life, that's exactly the way the enemy will view you. And so I would, I would throw this question back out. How do you view yourself? Here's why I, or how I think we ought to view ourselves. First of all, we are saved by the grace of God. We are somebody. The Lord loves us. The Lord cares for us. He 
died for us and he lives within us and we are blood bought and there's no reason that any of us should feel like we're insignificant. We belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and bless our hearts. We're not grasshoppers. We are saints of the living high God and we ought to begin to act like it. Amen? And so, the, the locust. And then have you ever watched a fly? I don't know. The only reason I can figure we have flies was so they could they mess up Egypt. Because I can't figure out any, any significance, any use for them. But you know what they'll do? They're a, they're a pest, but they have cushions on the bottom of their feet. And those cushions will allow them to go to the ceiling in your house or in the church, and they sort of use those cushions as, as suction cups, and they hang upside down. Sometimes in our spiritual life, at least in mine, I sort of feel like I'm upside down. I sort of feel like I'm inside out. I sort of feel like I just don't know which way to turn. And, and I do like a fly. Have you ever got a fly swatter to get a fly? A fly swatter or a fly knows what a fly swatter looks like. And every time you get one, they never lied anywhere, do they? And so you know what you want to do? The light makes them uncomfortable. So what Vicky does is she turns off all the lights in the house except the one right next to me. And she, and she gets the fly swatter, and here she comes. And she's ready to do havoc to that fly. And he always flies up underneath the shade, lands on that little spot where you can't get the fly swatter up there. And if you even look like you're about to get a hold of it, he takes off and you can't find him. And if the television is on, he always ends up on the television. I won't let her hit him on there. And so then, wherever the light's at... He gets attracted to that for some reason. We are the light of the world. And as the light of the world, Jesus said, as long as I am in the world, I'm the light of the world. Well, he's no longer physically here, but spiritually he lives within each and every one of us. And as we are the light of the world, the Bible said, a city that sit on a hill cannot be hid Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, that it gives light to all that are in the house. And then he said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So let's not be like the fly and just fluttering around and being a pest. Then have you ever watched a, a flea? Have you ever seen a flea? If you've got a uh, I, I need to be careful here because a lot of you are animal lovers and I love animals. But animals get fleas sometimes. Do you know what a flea does? If the flea wants to get from here to over here, that flea don't go over there. He don't walk over there. He doesn't jump over there. He'll get on the back of that dog and he'll let that dog carry him over there. He's like a hobo. A hobo is somebody that, that, that just lets somebody else take him somewhere. They don't expend any energy whatsoever. And boy, we, the Baptist church sometimes is full of us, aren't they? Uh, we just get to that place in our life that, that we say, oh God. I taught class this morning. I taught a little bit about the will of God. And one of the things that I know about the will of God, if you're going to ask God to show you his will, you got to be willing to do that will. And so what we want to do sometimes as good Christian folks, and we're good folks, but you know what we want to do? We want to catch a ride on somebody else. Let them do it. Let, let them be the dog. I'll be the flea. I'll just jump on their back. I'll be a cheerleader. I'll hoop and holler and I'll tell them, go get them and you can do it and you can do all of this. But God is saying he doesn't want hobos in his house. He wants you and I to come together and there's nothing, absolutely nothing that would be withheld from you and I in the glory of God and from this church if we unite together and we everyone find our place and do what God wants us to do. Yeah. Y'all to holler amen to that's a good, that's good preaching. That's awful good preaching. I told you you had a good preacher around here. <laughs> now let's think about the mosquito. Now, I don't know what you know about a mosquito, but I've seen tons of them. And uh, we went to Alaska one year with Troy and Bonnie and uh, their mothers and Hoy and Judy. And so there was, what, eight of us that went. And uh, 
uh, this had nothing to do with the message, but I'm going to tell you how, how wise Bonnie's mother was. We got to the airport, and she said, Oh, Lord, I've left my wallet at home. And Troy had to pay for every single thing she did. Wise woman. Wise woman. So we went to this place that had some signs out in front of it. And we were on a bus. We'd cruised for three days. We're on a bus, on a train. We're on this bus, and they've got these road signs. On the road sign, it says 368 miles from nowhere in any direction. But do you know that the state of Alaska has 1,001 species of mosquitoes? Wouldn't you think those rascals would die when it got real cold? But they don't. And when we were checking in to this particular lodge that we were going to stay at, out of those 1,001 species of mosquitoes, every one of them was represented in the lobby of that lodging place, and they buzzed all around our heads. And when we went to bed that night, I was up seven different times killing mosquitoes. And after you've killed seven mosquitoes and lay back down, even if you've killed every single one of them, your mind hears, doesn't it? And you think there's still mosquitoes in there so you don't sleep real well. So what's the point? Mosquitoes breed in stagnated water. When I was a boy growing up at the end of Michigan Avenue, there was a place out there called, the, we called it the Pollywog Pond. A pollywog is a little, uh, uh, little frog, ain't it? And so they had them, it was everywhere. There was vegetation everywhere, flowers everywhere. But in a few years, that water dried up. And but before the water had completely dried, it became real slimy, had an odor to it, and no life around it. There was no vegetation around it. There were no flowers there. There was no animal life that was left. It was just stagnated water. Now, Jesus says to you and I, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. And this spake he of the Holy Spirit. So it's the Holy Spirit that it's likened unto water in the scriptures. And he is to flow freely in our lives. He's to never get stagnated. We should always be sensitive to God's spirit. Always recognizing what he's trying to say to us. Always willing to do what he calls us to do and asks us to do. And so the mosquito breeds, he grows, and the eggs are, are laid and planted in this stagnated water. Let it never be said of your life individually or our life corporately as a church that we're in stagnated water. We want to be so the Holy Spirit can flow freely in our lives and so that there's something when people come to the house of God, they see the spiritual atmosphere. They see the joy in our heart. They recognize that there's something missing in their life. It's not that they're bad folks, but we want them to see a difference. So when they see us, they see Jesus. And when they see Jesus, they want Jesus. And when they want Jesus, he said, I'm here simply for the asking. All you got to do is call on my name. And then, let's talk about the spider. I'm sure you're all familiar with spiders. And somehow, in the abdomen of a spider, it can excrete this substance that ends up making this beautiful web. And the web is intended to catch the food that the spider needs to eat, and it protects the spider. But when the spider spins that beautiful, beautiful web, over time, the dust particles in the air will land on that web, and it becomes very evident where the spider web is. If you've ever walked into one and it gets all over you, you understand you've been in the spider web. One of the things that I would say to us, let's never let the dust settle on our web. 
Let's be what God wants us to be. Let's be jubilant in our lives. Let's put the web up and catch the enemy in it. Let's not let anything detour us from what we believe God wants to do in our lives as a child of God. And so that beautiful silk that gets spun, it's got a purpose until it gets all that uh, dust and stuff on it. Then we call it a cobweb. And so uh, make sure that your beautiful, beautiful life never gets cobwebs on it. And then, this one of my favorite, lightning bugs. Do you know what lightning bugs are? Now, when I was a kid, uh, we didn't have iPads and phones, and uh, we didn't have anything for that matter. Andrea asked me one day, she said, Dad, what did you all do when you were kids? I said, we played kick the can. She said, our, what do you, kick the can? How many has ever played kick the can? Well, more than I thought. We're the poor folk. <laughs> we didn't have things to play with. So we put a can down, and, and if you were rich, you'd have to go find somebody. If you found them, if you ran back to the can quick enough, put your foot on there and hollered their name, they were caught, and they had to go to jail. And I don't know how you all played it. We cheated a lot. But uh, uh, we played kick the can. But when dusk would come... Uh, and you could no longer see, we would, we would play catch the lightning bug. Now, these little lightning bugs, on their tail, they've got a little light. And the light would do this. The light would shine out. And, boy, you'd run over, try to grab one of them things. You had a jar. And on the lid of the jar, you'd take a nail and bust about three holes in there so them things you caught could live. And you'd try to take the jar and put them inside the jar and put the lid on real fast. But just as soon as you got close to him, his light would go out. And you'd have to look again. And then you'd see three or four of them over here, and you'd run over there. And by the time you'd get halfway over there, their light would go out. Friend, we're the light of the world. We should never be blinking. We should never be on and off. We should always have our light shining for Jesus. And so that everybody can see that light that's not set under a bushel, but it's the light of Jesus Christ in our lives. Then have you ever watched an ant? I used to sit on my front porch, and when I couldn't find friends to play with, I'd get a tennis ball, and I'd get a ball glove. I just about had a ball glove attached to my hand about every time you looked at me. And so on our front steps, I'd throw the ball against the steps, and I'd field the grounder. We, were, we lived in a two-story house, and right up above the porch was a space about this far was just wood, and I'd throw the ball against that, and I'd catch it. When it come back down, I'd get the fella out. Now, that may sound silly to you, but that's what I did as I was growing up as a child. And when I'd get tired, I'd kind of sit down on the front porch, and I'd look at the concrete, and in that concrete, you know, there's always cracks in the concrete, and that's where those little ants would build their little ant hill, wasn't it? Remember that? And I'd sit there and I'd watch them, and I'd see a little ant over here, just a little old fella, and he'd try to get a twig. And he'd come over here, and he's just, he's just diligently carrying that twig as best he possibly can. And if it was too big for him, you'd see two or three other ants come over there. They'd get a hold of that twig, and they would help him. Isn't that a great lesson for us? When our load gets too heavy and we don't know which way to turn, we've always got one another to come alongside of us and pick up our load and to help us with that and to say, you're not in this battle alone. You're not in this situation alone. Your circumstance may not be good right now, but I love you and I care for you and I'm going to be here all the time for you. And those little ants would just make this little ant hill, and, and, and me and Larry would sit there and watch them make that ant hill. And, and after a while, I'd do this. I'd just take my foot, and I'd go right over the top of that ant hill. Not one time did one of those little ants look up at me and give me lecture number 489. Not one time did they get mad at me that, that I knew of. But you know what they did? 
They never missed a beat. They just came over and start putting sand out. And in a few hours, if you look back over there, that sand would be heaping back up again and they'd be carrying that twig again. What a great lesson for the children of God. No matter what Satan throws in our pathway, no matter how tough it seems to get sometimes, and, and sometimes it's, it, it appears as if Satan has just rubbed our anthill out. You know what we need to do? We don't need to get upset. We don't need to get discouraged. We don't need to, uh, to do any of those kinds of things. All we need to do is just keep on plugging away. Just keep on carrying the twig. Keep on making the anthill. Keep on doing everything that we can do to glorify the name of Jesus. Now, the ants have a colony they have worker ants, they, they have a queen ant, and then there's the little males. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? How many in here are married? That sounds like our house, doesn't it? The queen's the boss. But then there's worker ants. And those worker ants evidently are just so entrenched and they're well organized and they're unified. They, they, they know what one another needs and they just all come together and they do three things. They're on offense, they're on defense, and they, uh, they make eggs so that they be more ants. Now in the offense, the offensive ants are builders. They're the ones that are carrying the twigs. They're the ones that are building the anthill. They're the ones that are at work. And in God's church, there's people that are workers. And I appreciate every single one of you. And there's, there's folks that God is saying, take this position, do this. You may not have ever done this before, but if God puts a desire in your heart, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Amen. And so, then there's defensive ants. These are the ones that fight. Now, I never did see one fight with me, but I imagine they might fight other ants. If other ants from other colonies come in and try to, try to mess with them, they're on the defensive. And then there's those that, that uh, put the eggs out in the sun so that the eggs can hatch and there'd be more ants. And that sounds to me like soul winning. That sounds to me like somebody wants to see birth to take place. And oh, how wonderful it's been the last few weeks to see people coming to faith in Jesus Christ and following the Lord in believer's baptism. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Say amen this morning. Amen. You look like you sucked on dill pickles all night. And then the ants are unified. They carry large objects, but you know what they're doing? When you see them working, they're storing up for the winter. They're storing up for the lean times. They're storing up for the bad times. The blessings that you're experiencing right now, you're going to need somewhere down the road because your lean time's coming. It comes to every single one of us. But oh, thank God for the times that we stored up the word of God in our heart and our mind. Thank God for the times that the Lord has blessed you in such a great and a marvelous way. And those ants are constantly at work and they're persistent. You wipe out their ant hill, they'll just build it right back up again. You wipe it out a second time, I know I've done so, they'll just build it right back again. Now, there are some ants called termites. And they live on dead wood. There should never be any dead wood in the house of God. Because if there are, the termites will come. And the termites destroy. Now, let me talk about two more and then we'll be done. The bee. I don't know what it is about the insect kingdom, but they also have a queen. They have one queen... They have up to 2,000 workers, and they have a few drones, they're called, which are males that are stingless. They're strong, they're active, they fly great distances, and here's the point I'd like to make with the, with the bee. That bee is looking for nectar out of the flowers. If you've ever watched a bee, it'll fly over to a flower, it'll hover its wings, and if you listen closely, you can hear a little noise, and he, he sort of puts his, his, whatever that is, down 
in the flower, and he sucks the nectar out of that. And they take it back to their hives, and they make honey out of that. That's where a lot of people uh, that raise bees, that's where the honey comes from. And so the bee will go over here to this flower, and he'll hover there, and he'll collect some nectar, and he'll leave that flower, and he may, he may go several yards maybe even 50, 100 yards, and he'll find other flowers, and he'll draw nectar out of those, and he'll go somewhere else to do that. And the next thing you know, he's drifted so far from the hive that he doesn't know his way back. He doesn't know what to do. So here's what the bee does. He flies as high up as he can get. He finds his hive, and he makes a straight line to that hive as fast as he can go. And that's where the term uh, making a beeline comes from. He's made a line back to the hive. Sometimes in my life, I've smelled the nectar of the world and I've kind of drifted somewhat away from the Lord. But the best way to get back is to go straight up, to go where God's at in prayer and in his word and in repentance and then make a beeline right back to where you left the Lord and where God can bless your life. And then I close with this. The butterfly and the moth. They both start with a little caterpillar, don't they? You ever seen little caterpillars? They've got several different legs on them. They, they can't go from here to here. It takes them about 20 minutes to get there. It just moves so slow. They're sort of ugly. But then something happens, and they go into a cocoon. And some of those come out as a moth. It has no color to it. And if you've ever noticed a moth, it's attracted to light also. It's almost as if the light bothers it. And it flutters around the light and it flutters away. And it doesn't seem to have any smoothness at all to its flight. And it's just hovering all the time. And it's ugly as it can be. But then you look at the butterfly. And you look at that when it comes out of its cocoon. And it's colorful and it's beautiful. And when it flies and moves its wings, it just moves in such such. Uh, uh, unity and in, in such a smooth way. And I liken that unto those that are saved by God's grace. We went into a cocoon one time, if you would. It's called a metamorphosis. That means there's a change that gets made. And all oh, thank God for the moment that we believed and trusted in Jesus Christ, and God made a change in us. He made a change in us internally. That that God planted down in the inside for him will never know sin again. It is eternal. It is everlasting. What God does, he does a good job on. But like the moth, when folks don't know Christ, there's no peace, there's no joy, there's no contentment in their lives. Oh, they think they're doing well and they think they're getting by. But I'm here to tell you, and I know you would do the same thing. If we know Jesus, if we know Jesus, you ever remember the bumper stickers that used to be out? No Jesus, N-O, Jesus, N-O, peace. No Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, K-N-O-W, Jesus, no K-N-O-W, peace. And that's really what's true, isn't it? And so are you a moth today or are you a butterfly? Let me recap this real quickly while they come with a, with a mess or a song. Let me recap this quickly. Are you a grasshopper? How do you view yourself as a Christian? Boy, I tell you, you're somebody, folks. You young people, don't you ever let anybody tell you you're not important. Doesn't matter how old you are, you're important to Jesus. He loves you. And I'll tell you, by the grace of Almighty God, uh, I'm going to do the very best that I can do as your pastor to build the strongest possible youth program that's ever been seen. And I'm not competing with other churches, but I, my burden in my heart is for you folks and for your parents that we can help you and help you establish yourselves in whatever God wants to do in your life. We're helping you to get to that place. And for you older folks, we haven't forgotten you. In fact, we're making a couple of changes uh, in pastoring. Uh, as you know, we voted to, to uh, license Brother Matt and I want to... Uh, my goal, i just be honest, my goal is to put him in uh, after a, a period of time to put him in as a youth pastor. And Brother Tony's got a desire on his heart to work with the older folks. 
And all you folks that fall in the middle, you got me. And and I'll oversee everything. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to strengthen ourselves. We're going to enjoy ourselves. We're going to have fun in the Lord. We're going to have power with the Lord. And whatever God decides to do in our life, hopefully we'll just say, here I am, Lord, send me. Use me. Do whatever you can. So if you've got children or grandchildren, if they might be the least, and they may be up in the college career age, you bring them because we want to be able to minister to them. And you come, and mamas and papas, you come. Because what we want to do is we want to strengthen our cause and the cause of Christ. Do everything that we can. We are a somebody in Jesus. We're not grasshoppers. And as a fly, let's don't be upside down and be a pest. And as the flea, the hobo, let's don't rely on other people. I honestly believe that I believe this my whole ministry. You are here for a purpose. If you've never been saved, you are here that you may hear the gospel and you can be saved by God's grace. And after that, you are here because God brought you here because he knows what you're capable of doing. He's working in your spiritual gift to complement this congregation. God wants you. God needs you. I had a preacher tell me one time, God don't need any of us. I said, well, then how's he going to get anything accomplished? Because he decided after he saved us to leave us here. And so the mosquito, let's don't have any stagnated water. Let's let the Holy Spirit flow. And, and I'll just cap off a couple more. The lightning bug, let's never let our light go off. Let's always keep it burning for Jesus. And let's be as persistent as those ants are. And let's be like the old bee if we ever drift Let's just get up where we need to go, find where home is, and make a beeline and get to home. Would you stand with me this morning? I know this has been kind of a foolish way of sharing some things with you, but I think with all of my heart, I truly believe that God has spoken to hearts this morning. This message has been on my heart for a while, and I've been going back and forth with it, for a while could you find yourself in there one of those insects that I mentioned could you see it's your life if you're here today you've never been saved God wants to make you like the butterfly wants to change you wants to do a great miracle in your life give you peace and joy like you've never experienced before and if you're one of those other insects if it's kind of spoke home to you And maybe you just need a little closer walk with Jesus. Today be a good day. Whatever your desire is today, God placed it there. And if you'll not listen to the opposition and you'll move on that desire, God will bless you. Verse of invitation, would you please? I want to take this opportunity to give you a chance to come by and greet these new members of Lakeside. And uh, I, I just would say this to you. Uh, we're not a perfect church by any stretch. But boy, we're a loving church. You'd never get loved anymore. God's put it on your heart. 
you consider that while we have this privilege. Uh, but before we, we do that, because I keep forgetting this, uh, on the 7th of March, I usually don't do announcements in here, but I think this is important. The 7th of March, which is a Tuesday night, it's the only night I could get uh, at 6 o'clock at Dixie Skateland for two hours, the rink is ours. I would encourage you to come, all of you. You don't have to skate to come. Come and let's just gather as a family and enjoy ourselves. And then two days before that, on the 5th of March, Matt is going to be sharing with us in the 11 o'clock hour He's going to give us a presentation on drugs. I have prayed about this. I have sought the Lord over this the best I know how to do. And I can get more people here on Sunday morning. And, and I don't know if I'll do a message afterward. I, I don't know. But I've asked him to do this and to put it together. Monroe, Michigan, County of Monroe, is the heroin capital of the United States of America. And we want to protect our young people. And we want you as young people and you as parents to recognize the signs of drugs. And he's going to tell you how early it starts and it'll shock you. And so that's going to be on the 5th of March, just in a couple of weeks. Um, so you invite your friends. Invite your friends to the skating party. Because what we're trying to do now is reach out and help people the best we know how to do. And Jason, I'd ask you to, to give an announcement uh, about uh, people coming and sharing on video and stuff. Would you come and do that right now? And then we're going to fellowship with him. I'm sorry to take this time, but if I don't do it now, uh, I'll forget it. And I, I think I want you to hear this. It's important. Uh, Pastor asked me if there would be something that we could do at the conclusion of our service that would somehow incorporate our members and our visitors. You don't have to be a member to do this, but if you regularly attend our church, we're going to try and spread the word as to what Lakeside is all about by using you folks at the end of the service. How many people watch Oprah and have seen that she does that like after the show? Well, the after the show with Oprah seems to be more popular than her actual show because it's just it's it's the folks that have you know that we're in the show and talking about the impact of the show well that's what we want to do with lakeside so um, what we're going to do is we're going to ask all of you to you know if to consider maybe coming back to the window and we'll have a microphone at the conclusion of every each service each week and this is going to be on our youtube channel so just know that this is going to be something that'll be broadcast so if you're not comfortable with that that's okay but just to come back with your family and and just to say you know, what, how the service was, you know, why are you at Lakeside, you know, how great our pastor is, how great our associate pastor is, um, how great the dinner was last week, or senior breakfast, or, you know, just say what's on your heart for just a few minutes in front of the camera, and then that'll be sort of the after the show at Lakeside, so that when people are watching our service, and we, we're getting about 50 to 60 people a week um, that watch our YouTube channel. So it'll be a good way for, you know, folks to be able to see at the conclusion of the service, just each people, you know, all of our members that, you know, want to speak and say, what, you know, why, why are you here at Lakeside? So think about that. Uh, approach me directly if you're interested, and we're going to start that real soon. Um, and like I said, all you got to do is just, you know, while fellowship is taking place or, you know, before you leave, just come up to the window and just a real quick, short, brief little, you know, this is why I'm here and this is why I love this church. So if you can help us out with that, that'd be great. Uh, so, Tom, let's uh, go ahead and have fellowship. Choir, Choir practice. Choir practice five. at five. And uh, we'll uh, see you. Thanks. Thank you. 